I enjoy coming to work every day, I really do. And this is just all day long, one piece after another. Well, I started here at the Wilshire Grand when it was just a big hole in the ground, a big footing, all dirt. It feels so good to be back up here and dedicate a nice little portrait to this place. It brings a great feeling going from the bottom to the top. The Trojan Marching Band kind of led the parade through the streets in downtown from Figueroa and up to uh, Wilshire Boulevard uh, to kick off the Grand Pour celebration. Right before we started the actual pumping, that a parade, USC came by, uh, the mayor, it was a big commotion, big, 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 you know, almost like a party. It was over 21,000 yards of concrete. We actually broke a Guinness Book of World Records on, on the most concrete place continuously. 13 pumps, you can see feeding down in the hole. Just like big arms just coming over the side of the, uh, the pit, placing, you know, concrete. Like the Super Bowl of concrete pours for me and our company. You know, all the cement trucks have certain paths to follow. All the pumpers do the right thing. It's like an opera or a ballet.
So you need a very, very wide base to anchor the tower against turning over in an earthquake so that the whole tower can't rip the base out of the ground as it, as it tries to sway back and forth. You know that building? Just looking at the Wilshire Grand. Every morning I wake up, I drive to it. Even on my days off on the weekend, I'll drive on the freeway and I'll look at it. I'll look at it on the weekend from my balcony, I could see it. But it's like looking at that thing, it's such a big part of me, you know? It just gives me a, a feeling inside of me of, yeah, of a big accomplishment. One, two, three, roll! One, two, three, roll! 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 I took some of my uh, paintings to the job site. They really liked it. I've sold like seven pieces there. A lot of them were surprised. Wow, Seth, you, you're an artist. You, you paint. You know why are you doing this? Why are you Why are you an iron worker? Why don't you just stick to your art? And I just, you know, <laughs> I love both worlds, though. If you zoom into my artwork, you see a little strokes. They kind of come together like a weave. I do a lot of that when I'm painting. I'm thinking of those designs that are in there. I always looked at it kind of like the fabrication of the, the, the rebar mat, the way that it looks, it's all weaved and crossed over, kind of like a, the, the human muscle scale, you know, it's all fabricated, it comes together, it's in her lap, everything's together, kind of like a shirt or a fabric. We're a family out here, union family, we're all united, we're all together. Sometimes we get frustrated, we yell at one another, we swear at one another, but, but at the end of the day we sit down, we, we share a sandwich or an apple or if you fall down, they're right behind you. Everybody here is a team. They're all warriors, you know. You gotta have heart to do it. Well, these are your vertical columns that um, support the building. They'll carry the horizontal floors. What they'll use on this particular connection is spud wrenches to align the holes. You always have a partner and there's a lot of communication. We get a job, we sequence a job. How we're gonna build the job, we put in a mill order. Three to six months later, we start receiving those particular members into our shops and start fabricating. This is parking level four. This here is a chain come along. We use it for such applications where you can't push something over. You got to get it pulled over. It's a heavy duty tool. Keep going. Keep going, Jesse. So right now we're at about 225 guys, the job will go up to 800 plus. We want to make sure that these guys are all working together hand in hand and the brotherhood really becomes very important. Now we have MEP guys, uh, you know, mechanical, electrical, plumbing guys as well on site, them working hand in hand as well. Right now we're doing the connections for the water heaters that are going to be supplying the hot water to the building right here at Wilshire Grand. We are connecting the water, also the gas, and we have the vent systems that are coming out of the building. Before coming to the trade, I used to work at a elementary school. I used to be a TA for LA Unified for 10 years, and now my children go to the school where I used to work at. The things that I try to talk to my children about the skills that are very important in, in what we do is math. And for me, math actually came very easy. 
He needs to have a lot of skills and know a lot of math because if he has to do a calculation on how short to cut a pipe so that it could fit in a certain place or at what angle to put it in, he will have to do like maybe division, multiplication, or addition, and maybe even subtraction. And he needs the skills because um, if he doesn't know how to put um, like a pipe into place, somebody else will have to do it and he'll get fired, I'm pretty sure. We have a one inch uh, pipe that we're running right now. And the first thing we gotta do is ream the ends and make sure that they're clean. Being a union plumber, we take pride in what we do. And making sure it's done right the first time is a big priority. It's very exciting for us as a family and a point of pride to know that my husband, his expertise, his skill set has had a hand in building a gorgeous building and being part of the city. Right now, I'm uh, looking for a slight change of color on the pipe and the fitting, showing me that the heat has been uh, sufficient to start melting the solder and have it penetrate. The model here, as you see here, is kind of uh, derived from the architect and the structural engineer. Um, and you can see it looks exactly like Wilshire Grand. It's 100% to scale. You know, what we do is take the architectural and structural design of the building, and then we use a third-party program in AutoCAD and draw our plumbing systems in 3D. Now I can accurately come in here, place my mechanical pads for all my equipment, run all my piping, and then we're using an electronic device called the Trimble Unit. It uses a GPS locator. And so all these mechanical hangers and things like this that were, are in our model, we load into this GPS unit and basically walk around and locate these. I grew up, you know, in a very peaceful uh, family, but um, I remember when everything, you know, started the war, civil war. One of my uncles got killed and then uh, everything got really bad. The only choice I have is I came to this country and, um, and I began working. I was 17, like my son, perfect example. So 17 years old and then I started working on janitor, you know, a restaurant. After that, I, I met my wife and uh, they introduced one of their family members from the union. That's when I started working for the local 300, 20 years ago. The person I look up to is my father, coming from El Salvador. The reason why he came over here, immigrated over here, was because of the civil war they were going through at the time. Every day, you know, he wake, wakes up super early, shows up on time, whether he's sick or not. He is always ready to work. For me, um, la familia tiene también un lugar muy importante porque si nosotros este, enseñamos a nuestros hijos que tienen que respetar, que tienen que ser responsables, es para que ellos también este, formen una, un, una mejor familia para sus propias vidas. Ajá. They raised me and my little brother with nothing but love, you know, and showing us the best, always pushing us to do the best for what we want for ourselves, you know, become better people. He wakes up every morning and, and goes to work, and he may be really tired at times, but as a man, I really do respect him because of how, how far he's gone, you know? And if, if anything, I, I want to be more like him. You have to be proud, you know, the, the job that you do, and they might look at you like you're dirty, you know, or, you know, sweating or whatever, but uh, I feel proud that I do something to feed my family, to bring food on the table. What I want for myself after I become, complete my apprenticeship, become a journeyman, hopefully make a good name for myself. I work with a guy that just knows, like he's probably the smartest journeyman that we have here at this company. And I'm lucky, you know, being a first year, I get to work with him, you know? So I'm really thankful for that. I was teaching my apprentice how to be an apprentice. Just taking direction, taking instructions. Sometimes I have to be tough on him. Uh, but teaching is more important than that. I had just gotten out of the Army. I was a little lost without direction. What I did was I, 
I signed up for some classes at Trade Tech as well as signed, the, um, signed up for the apprentice program in the Local 11 Union. About eight months later, I, um, I, I received a phone call that, uh, that I was accepted into the union and that's where I, my journey began. When we're working out there, we have to pay attention to every little step, every little move that we make and uh, really fine tune what we're doing. We can't just go and flip on switches or flip on panel breakers. We have to keep communication with our brothers so that no matter what, we're trying to keep each other alive. I met my wife on my first job site. Every morning I would go to Winchell's to get coffee. <laughs> Looked at her wanting a donut, but thinking, wow, I could marry this woman. And then I got the donut. <laughs> but I, I had no idea that a year later I would be giving her my phone number, asking her to be my friend, and it would turn into a, a family. <laughs> Sometimes I didn't understand him when he was talking to me, but uh, always he was trying to to find a way at the, and uh, to understand him. For me. And uh, it was for me it was cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want to be able to provide uh, my family with a, a a home and a safe environment for my daughter to grow up and learn and become whatever her heart desires. And uh, thanks to his work, we can get better things for her too. What I've learned about myself in this trade using my tools is that I can do whatever I put my mind to. I can do whatever the foreman asked me to do or whatever the journeyman asked me to do. And if I can't do it, I know I have brothers that we can come together and find a solution. This is the good. This is the good crane with the good air conditioning. Well, this crane's 180 feet up in the air, and we're uh, we're helping them build the decking down there. Now this is one unique job. Tower crane number one's booming down right there, and you can see the big block. That's where they're going to be putting in tower crane number two. Yeah, go ahead. Says your buddy Miguel of Conco. Can I get a pick at your 4 o'clock? Over here, we're going to grab this column. And we're just going to move it about 10, 12 feet to my left. 10 for Miguel, coming to you. In all my years of operating a crane, I've never had anybody get hurt under my hook. And that's, I say that with pride. I've never had anybody close to be getting hurt, never had an accident, no joking around when you're in a crane. Probably one of the most dangerous jobs on a construction site is anything having to do with the crane operation. Yep, there comes Casey right now with his hooks. And you can see a good operator, you can see how smooth and steady that hook is. A good crane operator would pretty much be able to put the, put the hooks right in your hand without much of an effort. Now it takes, it takes a lot of years of experience to get the hooks to be that smooth and steady. Casey's been an operator for many years. He's really good. <laughs> I didn't even know he was coming down with it. That right there, that big chunk of rebar reinforces the concrete. Three foot thick wall, all cast in concrete. 
there's an earthquake, the rebar keeps the concrete in place, the concrete adheres to the rebar. What we're doing on this tower is, is we're, we're building the spine. So, you know, you're standing here, I'm standing here, and without my spine, I couldn't be standing. So this is the spine of the building. Everything you see on the outside of the building, the structural steel, that's pretty much the shell. The concrete and rebar core is the, the spine of the building. I usually wake up at 4.30 in the morning, get ready, leave my house around 5, get my gear, walk into the site 15 minutes before, prepare, open my game box, wait for my foreman, my co-workers to start my day. We install materials on new construction sites to prevent fire. In case of a fire, it won't spread from one, one place to another place. And I like what I do and I feel like I'm making a difference in, in, the, in the case of an emergency that my job, what I did, prevent it from fire or, or something you know, from going wrong and it, my job was done. Before this, I was working at a company making shopping carts for $9.15 an hour and uh, this opportunity came to me and uh, my pay went from $9.15 an hour to $18.20 from one day to another. There's a fire coming up through these uh, floor penetrations and with the insulation and the fire caulking uh, will hold the fire for two hours. In prison, you learn how to survive, and some people come out with the same mentality like if they're still in prison. If you want to change, you're going to change. If you're going to lie about change, the truth is going to come out sooner or later. I didn't want to live the life I lived before. I, was, I went to prison when I was 31 years old. I came out when I was 35. And I didn't want to be the same person. I, didn't, I want to change. I'm like, I'm better than that. It's a good paying job, but um, it's hard work. It's an honest living, and it, it's, not a, it's not an office job, but if it wasn't for the tradesmen, where would these people in the offices be at? At my company, I told them I'm, I'm on probation, I just got out of prison, I am a hard worker, I'm willing to learn, and I've showed them since day one that I, what I was about. What, what my record says, it's something else. That was an old person. But I showed them that we all can change. Just because I have a criminal record doesn't mean that I'm not a good worker. I'm not going to let them down. Yeah, I can make it. Yeah, I can make it. Go on the other one. Try the other side. Try the other side. I tell my kids, um, my son, six years old, he knows that I'm a construction worker. He always told me, hey, Dad, you're a worker, construction worker. And I try to tell him, you know, the kind of things that's going on here on the job. This is a historic project. He'll be able to come here with his family, you know, when I'm long gone. I want my children to be happy and follow their dreams, whatever, you know, whatever those kind of dreams they have to, to try it, because I was able to try it. My mom works in the building next door. She's on the 42nd floor. She, she looks out her window and, and she's actually seen me out there on the floors. And that's a great pride. She's proud. And uh, there's, there's no feeling like it. Yeah, it's great. If people think that we're not skilled, I'd like to see them come out and put one of these pieces of pipe in, put one of these valves in. They couldn't do it. They wouldn't know where to begin. We're craftsmen. We're the last of the craftsmen. <laughs> 
And I didn't go to, to college or none of that. You know, uh, I picked the blue collar way and uh, it's paid off. It's been good to me. Uh, the trade's been great to me. Uh, I love what I do. I wouldn't have it no other way. I'm actually doing the caulking, installation of the caulking on the skylight. That part of the job is actually to keep water out so that way uh, no one gets wet or no damage that gets done to the building. Okay, let me go down soon. You want me to go over your rope or under your rope? As of right now, we're cleaning, back around the joint, taping it, and we have to cut this rod in half in order for it to fit inside of the joint. Get a little tape, you got a little groove in here that's kind of hard to get inside of here with the tape. Hang on, hang on. Uh, grab that material right quick and tell him to keep it coming. My daily routine every morning is 4.30 a.m. that I normally get up, come and to the kitchen and prepare my lunch. His name is Tango. I actually trained him probably 25, 30 years ago. So he's very good at what we're doing right now for this project. He's called Tango because his actual real name is Tang, which is T-A-N. I guess everyone had a problem with um, pronouncing his name, so the employer actually gave him the name Tango. We worked together like uh, something like 25 years already. We know his family, he know my family. After he the good person, everything I don't know, he can teach me. I have a lot of respect for Tango. Uh, he's a very hard worker. He's very uh, diligent on time. He's willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. So when I do introduce Tango, I don't say he's my coworker. I say he's a friend or like a brother to me. He's the best friend, you know. When I look at that building, at least I know that uh, I say I had something to do with being able to put hands on that building and make an impact on being proud of, of seeing, that, seeing that project when I pass by it. What is interesting to me about the sheet metal work is we take flat pieces of the metal and we can lay them out, we can cut them, we can roll them, we can bend them, we can weld them together, and we can create a multitude of shapes and forms. What I enjoy about the craft is uh, being able to work with my hands, having to use my head. You know, we have to measure. Sometimes there's changes that have to be made and you got to do them on the spot, so it's, uh, it's a challenge. It's good to have a challenge every day. It's something different. So it's good, you know, exercise for your brain. I like precious marbles and solid granites. Pretty much like all stones. I like stones that are, you can see through and, and that lighting can be used with them. Because of the beauty, the colors, the swirls, various color patterns. Yeah, I learned that I like to work with my hands. I like to create things with my hands and my mind too. There's a, there's a lot of mathematical you know, solving to figure out, you know, to place your first stone to build a whole building. There's something satisfying about being given the task and just the materials to make it happen and you find a way to get it done and then when it's done, it works right, it looks good and it functions as it's supposed to. My creativity would be the form of the weld, how the weld penetrates and how the weld forms around the pipe. When I leave it, I walk away from it, I make sure that that looks, aesthetically it looks, it looks nice depending on how you get to it. But uh, we do try to, to make it look good as well as, as its purpose to hold, hold that system together. Well, while I'm welding, my hand is actually moving faster than I can think. All day long it's numbers, breaking down fractions and turning them into decimals and, and 
marking elevations and every, everything is, is numbers on this job. You get to work with a lot of good journeymen over the years and uh, they pass down a lot of trade secrets and, and stuff that they've learned over the years and it's what we pass down to our apprentices when they, when they start. And, you know, we all take a pride in our job. I love that uh, just being outside, the outdoors, do what you want. Get the, get the wind, feel the wind, feel the breeze. Hold on, I got something for you guys right here. I take off my gloves. I get my rebar. I get my rebar just like this and I'll start just throwing it in there. Just like that. With my rebar. You know, I love it. And um, that's what this callus has come from. You need your hands out there in the field to work. You know, and um, you don't want to be having calluses where you can't do anything man your hands get all swollen and get arthritis and stuff just protect your hands guys it's not worth it when i look at my hands i think about all the hard work that they've done over the years that i've been an electrician and and and, and all the things that i've built and all the things that i've worked on not only at work but also being a father and how you take care of your kids your hands are you're, you only got two of them so you need to make the best of them. I tell my kids that uh, I come to work and uh, do something new every day, use my hands, and it's something that uh, we're gonna be able to see or uh, as far as the structures that we're working on. And uh, something to be proud of, something you could say you worked on. And uh, it's, you know, it's a good, honest living. Something I try to uh, preach to my children. Where he worked at before, every day, you know, he, he'd, you know, he'd wear, he'd dress up every single day. When he would come home from work before, he'd be like, so how was work today? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. And now it's like, we're like, okay, already. <laughs> he's so proud of like what he's doing. And, and that makes me happy too. I have two boys and uh, I tell them, you know, working with your hands, it's a sense of accomplishment because you feel like you, you're making a difference, you know, like you actually make things and you see them operating like we see our duct operating and uh, it's a big sense of accomplishment. I think my dad's like, it's crazy the stuff he does uh, working on like all the way up there. I couldn't do that, I don't think, I don't know. I'm proud of him, yeah. His hands used to be like silk, I mean seriously, like and, and now they're <laughs> <laughs> every day they're just new cuts and new things and I mean it's it's sad at the same time but it's just, I'm also just so proud of him that he just good. <laughs> I don't even know how to describe it. It's just, it's, it's neat for us. It's really, it's, it's awesome. My hands are probably the most important thing to me other than my head. When I look at my hands, I see a lot of bruises and a lot of uh, blisters. And I have calluses on my hands now. Even though my hands are kind of small, they're working man's hands, yes. Seeing how a civilization is created by building with your hands and watching it start from the beginning to the end and, and foreseeing it. Sure, somebody has an idea, but that same person can't come over there and lay a brick or hang the iron at 70 stories up in the building. Not everybody can do that. Back in the days, they had storytelling to tell the different uh, history that went on. So. Sheet metal is a way of telling a story, but you're telling it with your hands and with the objects you create. They're tools. They're basic, my hands are, is, is, it's an extension of who I am. of the braces is during a seismic event is to take all the energy of the earthquake into the braces and absorb the energy to where it's not 
being transferred into your vertical and horizontal members in the building. Each brace is roughly about 37,000 pounds and there's 80 bolts in each brace end. These four braces are basically uh, unique because of the seismic zone LA is in. What we have here is the 28th floor connection of a buckling restraint brace outrigger system. As the building leans this way, this plate tries to lean and rise up because the building is leaning this way. It's, it's, it's stretching on this side. So as the gusset rotates and rises, the buckling restraint braces, these diagonals, will try and push up against a perimeter column. They're connected at the far end. So under high winds, the building might sway perhaps two feet each side, and that's perfectly reasonable when you're talking over 1,000 feet tall. Under a big earthquake, the building could move five feet or more <clears throat> either way from center. This here is between levels 29 and 31. Then up at levels, uh, I believe it's 54 through 57, I believe we'll have them again. Then at the top of the house, we'll have the braces again. I really love this space because it shows the elegance and the efficiency of these buckling restrained braces. You can see they sail through space for three stories without any connection to the building. In order for us to maintain the flow of construction on this job, the welding that we have to do in these next three levels, we're working anywhere from seven days a week, 12 hours a day, um, up to 17 hours a day. The skylight itself was quite a challenge uh, to pull off in that it's a glass form between two massive buildings. Just to pull something off that's doubly curved and just morphic in form, very organic. So it slopes here and then it slopes down the back side. We had to be able to accommodate the complex angles that that creates, complex, concave uh, shape of the, the curve. My understanding from the architect is that the, they had some experience in the Yosemite Valley that they wanted to replicate in the form of the skylight. So it's a valley coming down um, and opening up into the open Yosemite Valley. And so when you look at the tower, they kind of see that as half dome. And then the podium is kind of like the solidity of the rock formations. And then between these massive building forms, um, there's a river that runs through it that was envisioned to be kind of a glassy form. It's like putting together a really complex puzzle um, in innovative ways that make it elegant and beautiful and a pleasant experience. So uh, from the architect to the field gentlemen who are, were here just installing, we're all artists. For those guys who are on top who are harnessed off, um, they must have uh, nerves of steel, you know, just standing there and being able to receive a piece of glass that's a couple hundred pounds and to get it just to place it so delicately in the right position so it doesn't leak. Pretty spectacular stuff from the workers. And now, uh, at this point in our careers, to be doing project over a billion dollars, the Wilshire Grand office and hotel project is just a capper to a wonderful career. As I watch the craftsmen on this project that are dealing in an artistic way with modern day materials, and it's thrilling to watch their work. So California history, California geology, the Sierras, the San Joaquin Valley, the beaches, it's all subtly referenced in the architecture of the building. Basically, we're uh, plumbing up the building, aligning it, 
straightening it out, you know, getting everything square and where they need to be on their coordinates. And all the columns need to be in a certain coordinates. And so we're pulling them, driving wedges, pushing them in and out off the core. To put the building where it needs to be. If this bay right here is out of alignment from where it was down below, then the man lift doesn't run right. If this column's not in the right position where it needs to be, then the glass won't fit correctly. It is more efficient for the Wilshire Grand Tower to be a rectangle and to be 73 stories tall, but can you imagine it would be a rectangle and it's not the icon that it is today? There wouldn't be a river. We wouldn't care. I used to work at McDonald's and now I'm working as an iron worker, union job. And well, I can tell you it's a lot better than working at McDonald's. I'm stressed out less. I live a little more better, way better. I used to make $8 an hour at McDonald's and now I'm making $17 an hour as an apprentice. We're in the chiller room. This is all chill water lines. This is a chill water supply and chill water return. So we insulate them because, also because these pipes leak. So by it being covered, there's not sweating, there's no water leaking and damaging any other equipment around here. I used to drive forklifts for $9 an hour, to now I'm in the 40s, I'm loving it. I just got engaged, I'm house shopping. And now I'm happy. I ain't got no kids right now yet, but I got plenty of cars. I got about seven cars under my belt right now. Some people might not see a relationship with what I do at work and these cars, but it's pretty much the same thing. You look at something, and you take pride in it, and you make sure you want it making it looking its best. So I do that to my cars and at work with my quality. So that's what I try to bring back home, and well, that's what I try to take to work. I was a bus driver before for 15 years, just driving around the city, taking people, you know, customer service. And now I'm at this trade as a construction worker, and um, I'm from Local 300. When I meet other women, it gets me, um, I get happy, like, you know, to meet another woman, to see another woman. I, I go and greet them right away and, and introduce myself to them because it feels good to see another woman in the job site. At the Labor's Boot Camp, we had um, different pallets. Uh, one was made out of um, concrete bricks and one was the sandbags. And we had to carry those um, 25 feet and then carry them back and forth four days. So I think it's more like a mind thing if you don't quit then you're good. I'm proud of this job because I'm hands-on. I'm doing it different every day. I have two boys. I have a, uh, Enrique and Brian Carrillo. One, my older boy is 17 and my youngest is 13. It's changed my life financially, yes. Like taking out my kids more often. Because of my wages and things, I'm able to do more things with my family. I was in sales and sales wasn't honest. This is honest work. You know, you're able to go to work, do what you do. You know, you don't have to lie to people or, you know, make up phony, phony business just to get that sale. This, you're just doing your specific job task. You get it done, your boss is happy, you get to go home to your family, and uh, you know, you're, you're proud of what you've done for the day. Because I left a job where I had no benefits at all. I had no uh, medical, I had no pensions, I didn't have good pay, and so I see the benefits uh, working for the sheet metal trade as far as helping my family, and it's a, uh, I could really see the benefits now. Well, we actually kind of live on the job because we're here 12 hours a day, you know, about five days a week at this time. But um, I still feel strong about this whole trade. I'm glad I made it this far. I get a lot of uh, encouragement to continue on to be a woman in the trade, you know, so nothing negative. Uh, maybe a few family members that are afraid for me, but all of it has been really uh, inspiring for others to know that they can do whatever they want to do. If they put their mind and, you know, their heart into it. I think it's really cool that my mom's working on the Walter Grand project because by what I heard it's one of the biggest so it's, it's one of the biggest projects out there currently. Yeah, the long day at work she does seem kind of tired because it's hard work lifting up tons of heavy metal and 
all this material. So I could see why it's tiring because of all the heavy lifting and all the climbing they have to do. Not to mention they're so high in the sky, which is kind of crazy to me. I have a five-year-old daughter named Amber. She already has pride in me being an iron worker. She's mentioned on a few occasions that she wanted to be an iron worker because I think she already gets the fact that I worked re work really hard. So I would like for her to have every opportunity in society to be able to advance in anything she wants to do. Every day I think about her safety because um, mostly due to the fact that you have, I have to picture this in my mind. Somewhere on a, on a building probably like probably three, three stories higher, probably even higher than that. Uh, my mom's like up there working hard. Not to mention that she's working with tool, like heavy tools that are always hooked to her um, waist. Tying off is, it's required six feet within the edge of the building. And it's done by attaching yourself, which is uh, tied off to uh, a harness and you clip yourself on what these safety cables that wrap around the building and they are meant to uh, sustain you should you fall. I spent a good decade working as a, a waitress. It wasn't enough to provide for my family. So long as you're willing to do the work and work hard and uh, prove that you deserve to be you know, an iron worker, uh, it'll come with all the rewards of uh, being able to provide for your family, um, have a pension, also have really great insurance. I'm really grateful for that because I'd, I've never been able to even provide at this level for my family in all the years that I have worked and I've been working since I was 15. Today is Friday, so we were, it's Hawaiian Share Friday or Aloha Friday. Um, from my understanding, when I was in school, one of the instructors said that it's like saying hello to the weekend um, and goodbye to the work week. So it's a tradition. The women that I think are like are kind of like pioneers, similar to like my mom and stuff, that have changed so much, would be like Rosa Parks. I just think it's really cool that she's going to be a part of that. She's one piece that's part of a big giant picture. Before I was doing this, I was uh, working for rock and roll bands. I was a roadie for rock and roll bands. As much as that was a great job, there's, there's no benefits and there's no retirement in being a roadie. So uh, I heard that uh, Local 11 was hiring. So went down, filled out the application, took the test. And uh, the rest, as they say, is history. I was always traveling, so. I didn't see my family. I have two kids, two d beautiful daughters, and so I missed a lot of them growing up because I was always traveling. But for the past five years, I've been home steady, and it's been great to get to spend so much time with them. I've got two daughters, 14 and 16. You know, they're amazing kids, and you know, I want to be a part of their life as much as I can be. Uh, unfortunately, in our uh, what we have going on right now with our, uh, our country is it's very questionable for women. I think it's important for my daughters to know that not all men are like that. And it's also important for my daughters to know that if they need me, I'm there for them, so. I remember when I was a young man taking the bus through downtown Los Angeles and wonder what kind of persons, what kind of people worked on these projects. This is 38 years ago. This is an, an Apache helicopter. Uh, I was assigned to an Apache unit and uh, we were out there for 15 months. This weapon right here is an M4. It's a little smaller than an M16 because I was in the 82nd Airborne Division and uh, we jumped out of airplanes so we had to we had to jump with the M4s were a little more compact so that we we would maneuver when we were in our parachute. When I joined the military I, I learned discipline and so whenever that transformed into becoming a professional electrician uh, it made a smooth process it just made a really good transition. My experience in Iraq was painful at times. You're very far from home, you miss your friends, you miss your family, uh, but you know you're, you're doing it for your country. 
it was tough to uh, to face death every day, um, but we learned as soldiers to endure, and uh, and that's what we did. We we kept going. I was deployed to Iraq in uh, I believe it was February 2003 until September 2003. We did the uh, initial penetration into Iraq. The discipline from the Marines be on time. If they tell you it's six in the morning, you're there at five. Be ready, you know, be alert, be aware. What the Marines taught me was to be self-reliant, but to also be a team player. And when assigned with a task, to make sure above all else that the task gets accomplished. Taking care of the crane, the discipline of watching over that, making sure it's safe operating order, and it goes back to safety, making sure you're watching out for your fellow uh, construction worker out here too. When they come back and serve this country, they should be the first ones that are eligible for these jobs. Hoorah. I did, I did lose friends, yes. Like I said, it, it, it's tough, it's tough, but uh, I'm in a much better place now. We don't sit around in a desk and get it all uh, jelly. You know, we're strong. We work, we work with our hands and our back. I'm feeling it right now. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit beat up. You know, I'm 52 years, and I've been doing this for 33 years, 34 years. I've had many choices to do many different careers through my life, and uh, I chose this, and I still keep going back to it. It's, uh, it, sometimes it can be tough because, you know, as soon as the job's done, we're, we're done. Sacrificing your body for the job? Absolutely. Uh, it definitely takes a toll. You know, even simple things, up and down a ladder all day, ruins your knees. It's sort of a trade-off. You, you understand that your body's gonna take a beating, but a lot of people, especially when they're younger, they, they take the, the mindset of, oh well, yeah, I'm gonna beat up my body, but I'm young, so I'm okay, and plus I'm gonna get paid well to do it. So they kinda, they take the trade-off. My body is kinda tired a little bit. After all week of running and gunning all week, go, 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 starting to wind down towards the end of the week, you know, it's starting to get a little, little tired. Once I got in, I seen what it was and I seen how hard it was from the sweat, the blood and the tears. And my shoulders were bleeding when I first got in. It was hot in the summer. There was times where I, when I was getting in, I wanted to just give up and like, man, no, is this for me? But you know, I got a family that I got to provide for. And you know, I got things that's bigger than me. Putting the rebar on his shoulders and they were like hot and his shoulders were like burning. I appreciate him. I know he's a hard worker. And I know that anything he does, he does to the best of his ability and goes beyond. I think about my life all the time while I'm driving. Every morning when I get up and driving to work, I thank God for waking me up every morning. I thank him for my kids. I ask him to guard my kids' mind, to guard my wife's mind, and let everyone and everything they come in contact with be blessed, same as me. But in the end, it's all worth it for your family. It provides for them, so that's a good thing. Small sacrifice to make. People don't really don't understand what it takes and what we do with our bodies. Our bodies are basically our, our money makers. We gotta take care of our shoulders. We gotta take care of our knees. We gotta take care of our feet. We gotta take care of our hands. It was the best seat in LA. It was above everything. I could see Catalina most every day. On clear days, I could see San Nicolas Island. It's like 90 miles out there. I love the sunrises here. We had them warnings when I'm waiting on the next crew to get there. And uh, you just swing the crane around and check out the sunrise and they're beautiful. So 
so yeah, you, you could sit there and uh, get lost in the moment and just, you know, think about things that have happened in your life or whatever, but it's just being there and enjoying it. It might be weird for other people, but when I first started just walking around and seeing a bunch of gloves everywhere, gloves and wire and just uh, nails and all kinds of material laying around, for me it was pretty artistic. Seeing all kinds of things in the job site is it's the mess, the noise. For me, that takes you away from, uh, from the moment. It, it puts you in another zone, if you will, you know? I think running conduit, it's, it's artwork in itself. You gotta make it clean, everything's gotta match. You know, some people might think it's just pipe, but it's kind of beautiful in my eyes once you're finished with it. And in some way, it's kind of elegant looking when you look up there and everything flows all together in, in harmony. It just, it looks, it looks great. You build a job like a craftsman should, a professional craftsman, and you turn over a project that you're proud of. You have to be able to see the big picture before it's even created. And to me, that's being artistic. But to the average person, I don't really know too much if they would, would think it's a beautiful thing. But for us, it is, because this is what we do for a living. This is what we take pride in. We sculpt this. We have to build it, and we have to design it. And it's got to look clean. It's got to have nice lines. Everything's got to flow. Um, it's, it's definitely beautiful to me because because we make it. I get here probably around 5, 5.30 in the morning. It's actually eerie quiet. You hear footsteps all the time. You're not sure what you're hearing, but you know you hear footsteps all the time. Yeah, I remember the first uh, weekend that, that we worked. It was like 4 in the morning. And I came in off the street and walked down the ramp. It was like hauntingly beautiful to, to hear my footsteps and they, as they were echoing. For a while there, I kind of thought that I was the only one in the building. And that was even, that was sort of, it was really surreal. It was a surreal moment. You hear the sound of the crane cranking up. You would know something's about to go down. Maybe a horn blast or people shouting certain things out or sound of bars dropping so you know there's work up on the deck. 46 going up, 46 up. 31 down, 31 down. The sound starts coming alive. You, you hear screw guns going off or you or you'll, you just hear guys talking. And that Wilshire Grand sound, that's sort of a white noise, but it's just, you know, it's the life, you know, the, the workers coming in and giving life to the building. It's beautiful. It's a full-on symphony of sounds all the way up the building from bottom to top. A bunch of harmony going on on the job sites that puts things together, almost kind of like going to a theater. Just knowing that I'm in such a powerful city, is, it's, you feel the energy of it. It's just roaring at you, you know? Even being up there, you just you feel that energy. Everything's so alive. The arteries of, of the city are the freeways, you know? It's, it's wild, man.
we'll have a topping out ceremony and we will celebrate uh, that we have uh, a great building that we provided and it will celebrate the life and the good fortune of the people that get to occupy it. We'll have a uh, evergreen tree on it to symbolize life and we'll have an American flag on it. And if it wasn't for your effort that you guys bring every day, no matter the weather, no matter the challenge, you guys meet it head on. Here we are signing the beam on Wilshire Grand, March 8th, 2016. One more year to go. The tricky thing about this crane is uh, the swings are on my feet. It's a little different than most cranes. Most cranes will have it, the swing will be on this hand. The swingers are on my feet, so this crane takes two hands and two feet to run all the time. I'm going to take it back over in the middle and let the connectors hook it up. So we work together. I mean, I get it close, and then uh, my phone man tunes it in. Everybody's sure got to be on their game, that's for sure. Cranes can be very dangerous. Those two fellas right there, those connectors, they're some of the best I've ever worked with. One of the last storms that we had roll through, we had a really good lightning show. I was able to watch it come in and watch the lightning just start hitting, blowing transformers up out on the horizon. And then as it got closer, it hit just on the other side of the LA Care building over there, it hit on the back side of the PWC building that's right over here to the north of us. It was probably the one time I've actually been scared in the tower crane because probably one of the highest points of metal in the sky that it's just begging to be hit by lightning. If you're bored sitting in a community college classroom right now, or if you're in high school wondering what you want to do, and if you're not afraid of heights and you enjoy great views and working with some really good guys, this might be a job for you. That was good. That was the best one. This is going to be the sale of the Wilshire Grand, the top of the building, the very, very top of the building. My responsibilities are everything to do with the guys that are working for me, erecting the building, I'm sending iron up, unloading iron from the street and bringing it up here. And then I direct my guys as to how we're gonna put the building together and what pieces go in what order. I also have to keep an eye and make sure that they do that the safest way possible 
as well as the, the fastest and correct way of doing it. Our piece count, how many pieces we get a day, that's how we make our living. That's how we go on to the next job. That's our reputation. It's a whole raising gang. We wanted to get up there and have a picture taken. So we went up in a basket and got dropped off, flew the basket about 20 feet away from us where someone proceeded to take pictures. Yeah, yeah, in that picture, we were tied off. We're not going to take an unnecessary risk that we don't have to. Back in that picture of the Empire State Building, you didn't see them with lanyards. Well, it just shows how iron workers really are, you know. And, uh, you know, we do this every day. They really, there's no fear up there. So that's how they were, that's how we are. Oh, yeah, they deserve to be on that spire. Heck, yeah. These guys made it happen. You know, there's a lot of pride that goes along with that picture, so. Yeah, I think everybody around the world should see it. How many people get to come up here and work and have this beautiful view on the 73rd floor? I could see the whole world right here and it makes me feel good inside to know that I'm part of history right here. Sometimes it's time to go home. I've learned a lot over this, a year and a half and ready to move on to the next project. I was here at the beginning. I'll be here close to the end. And that, that's a really good feeling. Every time I pass by here, I just look at the Wilshire building 
and I pointed to one of my friends or my fiance. I'm like, look, look at that structure. Look at that building. We're a part of it. I love it. We have the town we call home, Wakening for Dawn. Which isn't yet here, but is promised. We have. Our retired neighbors rising in ones and twos. We have. The sky slowly separating itself from the houses. To become the sky while the stars blink a last time. And vanish to make way for us to enter the great stage. Of an ordinary work day in ordinary time in which we shall live for this day or not at all. Today, we shall work for we are all true artists. Train in the beauty of the eight hour day. Today, we shake the iron, run the pipe, and wire the lights. Of a building that sometimes broods or glows. Call it a long day if you want, and a hard one too. But remember, we got more than we gave. In the ride home, we hear the birds gathering. In the pine and birch trees, picnic with sound. And no one cares if we sing to the orange sun. That also seeks its rest. No one cares that our voices are harsh from the dust and our ears worthless. Our timing off and we've got the wrong words. In the wrong places, let's just give it what we have. And when that's done, give it a second time. One for us and one for our brothers and sisters. And even a third wouldn't hurt. Uh, when you don't get fired after, after your second day, 